I, I cannot even begin to tell you how many clients of mine were all say, you know, we're talk, we go in within. So I'm going to talk soon about not counting. And I'm like the anti dietitian dietitian, because most dietitians were trained to count, calculate, measure way. And I don't have my clients do that. I want to go within. This is the mindfulness piece. This is like listening to your body. So I've spent my whole life studying naturally lean people ever since my dance teacher said that to me, I was married to a naturally lean person for many, many years. I, my best friend is one of those. I, I actually did a video on this. I'm happy to share like the five habits of naturally lean people. Cause I'm not naturally lean. I have to think about it and work on it all the time. And so I've employed these ideas, these habits that I've noticed and studied over these years into like, I've, I've made them tools for me to, to practice, even though it's not natural for me. One of those is learning hunger satiety. So naturally lean person will be like, oh, I ate a lot last night and I'm just not that hungry today. So I'm just going to eat less. And they don't think about that consciously necessarily. It's just natural. It's just like, they just don't eat as much. So it's interesting. Cause I'm like, oh, it's time to eat. It's time to eat. You know, like, you know, you learn all these habits. We're socialized. Everything about food is habit. Everything about food is habit. And we are so social and we are socialized in all these interesting, intricate things. It's really interesting. Um, so learning to recognize hunger and satiety has been one of the things I spend the most time with clients on. Most people are like, I don't know what I'm truly hungry. I don't know when I'm actually full. And I find this very fascinating. So this is just an idea. I don't really love this scale, but I don't have more a uh, specific one, but think about it. If you're at like a one or a zero, let's say I use zero sometimes it's like empty. Like you haven't eaten for day or days or whatever. You're really, really hungry. And we'll talk about that in a second. I use a celery stick test for that. And then a 10 would be after a huge holiday feast. And then you have one more serving of dessert. And then it's like, well, you're so full. And so the celery stick test is the hungrier you are, the more everything sounds delicious. Like I love celery. It's great. But it's not the first thing I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about food. It's not like, ooh, I want some celery. But if I haven't eaten, I'm really super hungry. The celery starts to sound crunchy and watery. And I start to like, my mouth starts to water when I think about celery. So that works. Like if you know that you're as hungry, like if you can't tell what hunger is at first, use that test. Say, am I hungry enough for celery stick? And the opposite, I always think about my grandma. She was so cute. She would, we would be at breakfast and she'd be talking about lunch. And then at lunch, she's like, what are we going to have for dinner? I'm like, grandma, I'm like, we'll just talk about this later. Like I didn't want to think about food. Like when you're eating, you don't want to think about the next meal. You're just eating that meal. So it's really helpful to be hungrier to make those decisions. And that's kind of a way to think about, am I actually hungry? It's one way to think about it. You know, I love the way I think Dr. Furman's coming up after this. Um, but I love the way he talks about toxic hunger. He posted this on my blog many, many years ago, and I love his idea about toxic hunger. Many of us think of hunger as being hangry or the headaches or the fatigue or the, there's all these symptoms that people think as hunger. But if you think about it from an anthropological standpoint, if you're hungry, you better be ready to hunt and gather. You got to get food. Otherwise you're not going to survive. So it's a survival adaptation to have energy and feel good, even if you're hungry. So it's not like you're going to be fatigued and, Oh, I can't move. And I'm, I've got headaches. And so what, what Dr. Furman says is it's more of a detoxification symptom. Those symptoms of shakiness, the headaches, the hangriness is a detoxification symptom of a poor diet. So if you're on a really super healthy diet, you won't experience those symptoms. And I'll tell you this, we're going to talk about circadian clocks and everything. You will know your body is like, okay, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. And you, your body will know, like if you eat at the same time every day, our circadian clocks are so brilliant that we will tie into that. So if you're feeling anything else off of that, it's because of maybe having something that was off plan or because you're transitioning from a standard Western diet. This is what I see very commonly in my clients. So that's what I use with my clients as practice. The other part of that is satiety. This to me is the hardest thing in the world. And my clients, I, we spend so much time on this because I, I don't have an off switch. I love to eat. Obviously look at my life is food. I talk about food all day long. I love food. I love to cook. I love to eat. I love to socialize with food. I'm like most people I love to eat. And so it's hard for me to stop. And I've, I've studied the behavior about this and the psychology about this, um, about this, like, you know, once you're eating, you've got the hand to mouth thing and it tastes really good. It's hard to stop. And to know what is a four or five, can I stop now? So I've employed these techniques of my naturally lean friends and 
And I try, this is what works for me. And I, I, my clients have been helped by this technique. Also, I will stop that when I think I could still eat a lot more and I put it to the side and I distract myself. I just need, you just need to create one minute of space. Remember mindfulness is being in the moment and having space and just creating a moment of space and awareness. So I will move my food away from in front of me and I will distract myself. If I'm not with someone, I will, you know, I'll just go and check what, do one more email or respond to a text or check my Instagram real quick. And then I say, okay, uh, can I be done now? And I really kind of tune in. I'm like, wow, you know, cause sometimes it takes a little bit for the stomach to tell the brain that you're full. Right. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but it, you know, that's what happens. So then it's like, you know what I can do now. And then sometimes I have to tell myself I'll eat more if I get hungry, just so like, just to quell my brain. And that really helps me learn. And then I have my clients practicing. Okay. Did you stop at a four or five or six? What number were you at? And then we're, we'll start recording this. So you start to learn. We're learning our bodies because we have been socialized out of our body. We eat because it's breakfast time. It's lunch time. We eat because it's we're all eating or we're eating because we're at the movies and everyone's having popcorn. We eat because it's, you know, this holiday and we're supposed to eat this, that, and the other we're eating because of every other reason, rather than, are you hungry? And when I ask my clients, are you really hungry in the morning? And most of them say, no, not really, but I thought that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, that's all marketing and it's all socialization. And none of that is really true. You need to eat when you're hungry and not any other time. And you need to stop when you feel satisfied because your body will naturally gravitate towards its healthy weight. If you do that, but it takes practice. It takes so much practice again and again and again and again and again. And everything about that is practice. And we will talk about that. And then there is the concept of breaking the seal. And we're going to talk about that next. So don't break the seal. I always thought about this, but then I had a client slash student in Thailand that he was joined us in Thailand. He said this concept to me and it just summed it up brilliantly. Don't break the seal. So like last night, for instance, my daughter was eating this curry that smelled amazing and it looked amazing. She's like, mom, don't you want some? Don't you want some? And I wasn't hungry. I was not hungry. So I didn't need to eat. And I know that if I had one bite, that wouldn't have been the end of it. So I don't, I know that if I say, I'll just have one bite, it's never that you're breaking the seal. It's like, Oh, I'm going to have one bite with well, that tasted so good. You know, it lights up your brain. So I'm going to have more and more and more. And I know I have certain foods that I can't break the seal on. Like if I have one piece of vegan pizza, I'm going to want to have the whole vegan pizza. There are certain things that will like stimulate that breaking of the seal for me. So know thyself and know that if you're, it's not on your plan to eat this time or this meal, don't break the seal that you don't say I could just have one bite because we are human after all. And that one bite will lead to usually a cascade. So keep calm. Don't break the seal. Okay. And back to this counting idea. So I do not count, calculate, measure, weigh. There's no calorie counting. There's no macronutrient counting macro ratios. We're going to talk about that. How many of you have been counting calories and counting all that? It is almost impossible to be super accurate, right? You know, we, we don't really have the tools to, unless we're weighing and then sticking them in a calorimeter and really getting an accurate measurement, we're guesstimating fine. That's fine. But it leads to so much frustration for people. And again, if we can talk about food and look at the mindfulness and eating when you're hungry and stopping, when you feel just satisfied that's really helpful rather than having to try to micromanage everything with calculations. I find so many people are frustrated with this and it's not very helpful. So even though some of my clients try to sneak in some calorie counting, it never seems to make sense when we do the accounting and we look at the rate of loss and why it doesn't always make sense. So we also don't know exactly how much we're burning. You know, we, these movements, these twitches, whatever you do throughout the day, those add up too. But can we really calculate the numbers that you see when you go on the treadmill and it tells you how many calories you're burning? Not accurate. These things are not really exactly accurate. You'd have to be full on exactly measuring and you don't need to. The good news is you don't need to, and it'll save you so much stress from not doing that. I'm very passionate about changing this conversation about macros. This has become such an ordeal. Like you guys hear about it all the time. Oh, what, you know, I'm eating, I'm counting my macros and I clients reach out to me or people, potential clients reach out to me every day asking if I will tell them a plan to meet their macro needs. And absolutely not. I will not do that. I refuse. It's ridiculous. There is no ideal ratio. 
the reason there's so much divisiveness and discrepancies and conflict about this is because there is no magic number. Look at the Okinawan diet, very low fat diet, one of the healthiest diets ever recorded, right? Just the healthiest population, one of the top and very low fat. But then you look at the Mediterranean diet, also known as the best number, you know, world's best diet every year. They always say that very high fat diet. And then everything in between there, you know, the raw food diet could be very healthy and it could be a high fat one with it doing a lot of nuts and seeds and avocado and all that. And there's the, the, um, the low fat fruitarian raw people that are very low fat and they also can be healthy too. So it's just, there's no ideal ratio. There's no reason to sit here and macro confuse ourselves. And, you know, here's a little image, this little chart I did in my, this is from choose, you know, diet it's in the book. And I compared, for example, hundred grams of baked potato, white potato to hundred grams of a donut. And they've got about the same carbohydrate. I can't read this. Um, I'm having a birthday on Monday and I, my reading is the first thing that is gone. <laughs> so about the same amount of carbohydrate, but look at the difference, like 32 grams of sugar versus one gram of sugar, 0.1 grams of fat versus 20 grams of fat. Our bodies don't recognize a baked potato in the same way it recognizes a donut. It goes in the body and completely different metabolism, all sorts of different things happen. It's stored differently, it acts differently. It responds differently to our blood sugars and all of that. So the idea that we're comparing this, this is what they look at when they're doing these studies, right? They're looking at just carbohydrate. They're linking stuff together like refined sugar and a bean, but a starch and a fiber is very, very different than a refined sugar. Very, very different. So we need to get that conversation back to food. What is a carb? You know, you could call chitin of crab shells carb. Paper is a carbohydrate. These are biochemistry terms that we used to describe things way back when. And it's just been just. I would say devolved into this conversation that is so meaningless that it's confusing even healthcare professionals and researchers. The penultimate example of this that I always refer to is the 2018 Lancet Journal. And by the way, this happens all the time, but this was like, when I saw this, I'm like, this is so ridiculous. The conclusion was both a high carbohydrate and a low carbohydrate diet increased mortality. What do you even do with that information? What do you do? Do you do a low carb, high carb? What's a moderate carb? So if I tell my clients, make sure you're eating a moderate carb, low glycemic, high protein, moderate fat diet. What does that even look like? Well, how do you translate that into reality? Well, most people are having a really hard time with it. And so let's just ditch that. Let's bring that conversation back to food. We know what a vegetable is. We know what a fruit is. We know what a whole grain, a legume, a mushroom, a seed, an herb, and a spice is. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about food groups. Let's bring the conversation back to something that we can relate to. All right, let's talk about schedule. The information on time-restricted eating has been so mind-blowing for me that I have to talk about it. I have to employ it. If someone told me, I don't know, 10 years ago that I would be eating once a day and loving it, sometimes twice a day, but I prefer once a day and I feel so much better. I would think that was insane because I was a personal trainer. I was eating six meals a day. I was eating 18 egg whites and you know veggies and chicken breasts, like so much has evolved since then. But the idea that I feel best on one to two meals a day and not just me, all of my clients that are like, I could never do that. They all appreciate and love it after time. So we'll talk about that. But the data on uh, time restricted eating is extraordinary, not just for weight loss necessarily, but for health, for health span, for lifespan, like the evidence that keeps growing is obviously just, it's just emerging. We've had data on fasting for however long for so many, like hundred plus hundreds of years, like they've been fasting since Hippocrates. Right. And the information is so fascinating. One way to employ all of the benefits of fasting on a regular basis, and I would say a less painful basis, because you don't have to go weeks or, you know, days or weeks without eating is to do it on a regular basis where you're just giving yourself some time in the fasted state. So here's an example. This is from my last book, health Band solution. Every time you eat from that last bite, it takes about four to six hours to finish the digestion, the metabolism, the absorption, all the stuff, the cascade of beautiful events and chemicals and hormones and everything that gets released in our bodies, this whole process that takes place really important. Obviously we need fuel, but 
it's very labor intensive. So all of our blood shunts to the, not all, most of our blood shunts to our GI tract. A lot of energy goes to the GI tract and it's, you know, takes away from other things. So when we're in the fasted state, our bodies get to do all sorts of things, autophagy, metabolic house cleaning, getting rid of cancer cells and getting rid of, you know, virus cells and fighting off this and strengthening this and rejuvenation, refreshment, all these things that need to take place sometime. So if we give ourselves more time in that fasted state, it's really healthy. Like we give ourselves time to all those other things that we need to do. So think about what we mostly do now. Look at what we all like the the current way of eating is we wake up, we have our coffee with our creamer and sugar. Boom. You're in the fed state. And then we have our breakfast. And then by the time we're still in the middle of this, this curve here, Oh, it's time for lunch. And then we're having our lunch. And then by the time we're starting to come down from that, Oh, time for a snack up time for dinner. We never get into that baseline fasted state. And then we eat before our little, our little nighttime snack while we're watching a movie and then time for bed. So then you still need four to six hours from the last bite to finish that process where you can start to benefit from sleeping. And by the way, the sleep is so important for your cognition, your memory, and all of that. If you're in the fed state, it's taking away from that process. So it's really, it's amazing what you can do with just limiting your time and go into a limited window of eating. And usually that's a four to six hour window, but the evidence is kind of still like you could do 12 hours and still be better. I think it's compared to what I always say compared to what is the question not asked often enough. Everything is compared to what? So that's what, when you look at the research, it's just, what were they doing before? But um, I like to do a four to six hour window, but and it seems to be very effective and very um, doable for my clients, very comfortable. And uh, you have from the first bite to the last bite, four to six hours, You could plan it accordingly. Like if you like to eat with my clients that love to eat dinner with their family. So we have the first meal a little bit later. Most people aren't hungry first thing in the morning, but those people that are really hungry in the morning, that's even better. There's a little bit of advantage to shifting your calories earlier. Uh, So, but either way, there's still advantages. So then you would have your meal earlier and then stop late earlier. It's an amazing thing to play with. And the body is so extraordinary. We are so gorgeously tied to nature. We've got these circadian patterns that are, you know, a daily cycle. I've got a nightly, a monthly cycle and annual, all these seasonal cycles. It's so gorgeous the way our bodies are. Our bodies are so magnificent. We don't even give it credit for all the stuff it could do. We try to micromanage everything and we really don't need to. But this, this uh, chart is from the health fan solution also. And it just shows like all the amazing things that happen, like everything about food is habit, but our bodies are on a, on a clock. Okay. So we wake up because our cortisol levels go up, we warm up. And so boom, we're up and ready to go for the day. You shoot your eyesight, you get some bright sunlight into your eyes. And that's really good for your supra chiasmatic nucleus to get that all stimulated. And, you know, to get back to stay on that pattern, if that's why seasonal affective disorder is a problem when you don't get the sun first thing in the morning or at all throughout the day, depending on where you live but that's really important. And then you see all these different things that happen. And then at nighttime, you know, our our melatonin kicks in, we cool off and we're able to slip into slumber and then we repeat. So all these other, there's a million other things that I'm, I'm omitting because for purposes of time and for, and for aproponus, it's just, this is just, it's just amazing. So my point is that if you eat at the same time every day, let's say like for me, as soon as we have like work right now is my time of day. So I'm getting a little hungry, but that's okay. When I'm done here, I'm going to be having my big meal of the day. So if you eat at the same time every day, like my body knows it's time to eat, it's time to eat. This is 11 o'clock. I eat it's 11 o'clock. I'm in Los Angeles and um, your body will get used to it. And all of my clients are like, Oh, I can never do this. They all say the same thing. Everyone that tries it and sticks to the same time every day, their body's like, Oh, like right now it's 10 57 or whatever. I just looked at my, yeah, 10 57. My body's like, it's time to eat. So your body gets used to it and it's really comfortable and it gets really familiar and predictable and easy. It's really neat. Mm-hmm.